I'm Swizzets and this is Shatran's React Native School. Today we're building a React Native chat app. Because chat apps are harder than they look, this one's going to have only three features. Users have identity, everyone get, sees a list of messages, and messages update in real time. The things we're not building, like notifications, background app refresh, and things like that, we're going to do those in part two in two weeks. Here's what you'll learn in this lecture. Firebase for keeping apps in sync and saving data to the cloud. Redux for managing state in the app itself. How to build a simple form and how to keep a list view scroll to the bottom. Let's start with Firebase. Firebase is a cloud backend provider that lets you build apps without developing any server technology of your own. You can just store JSON data to the, to the cloud and then read it back whenever you want. The nice thing is that because we're building a chat app, we can also use Firebase's real-time update capabilities where anytime you save something, all of your clients immediately get it. If you have a Google account, you already have a free Firebase account as well, so you should definitely set up your own app. If you don't set up your own app and you use the credentials from our GitHub repository, you're going to be able to chat with everyone who builds this app through the tutorial. I don't know yet if that's a good idea or a bad idea, but I guess we'll see. You can see the details for setting up Firebase in the article down there. Uh, I don't think they'd make for a very good video, but the gist of it is that you will end up with a Firebase JS file that sets up a single tone so that anywhere in your app you can import Firebase and it's already set up for you to use with your credentials and stuff. Redux. To be honest, I'm not entirely sure how to explain Redux. I've, I gave it an attempt in the article, but I, I find it kind of confusing. Redux is, Redux is really hard to use for me. Um, it just like doesn't gel well with my brain. There's too much going on. But the gist of it, according to my understanding, is that you have functions and some of them are reducers and they change data. Reducers are basically functions that tell you how to go from one state to another state. So for instance, they would add plus one to variables or change values of keys in your global data store and stuff like that. And then you have actions that tell reducers what to do. This mostly manifests in actions having names and then reducing, seeing reducers seeing, oh, hey, this particular action was triggered, so I better do this. Or, ah, it has that name, so I better take this value from the action and put it in there. Stuff like that. Here's how our Redux is set up. I'm going to start with the actions, then I'm going to show you what the actual data store looks like and how all the reducers combine together. We have a lot of these small actions that don't really do much. Things like add message, send message, start fetching messages, received all messages, uh, set user avatar, user name, and so on. All they do is they are a function that you call and they return an object with a name and some data for that action. And it's actually that object that you return that is the action. The function itself is called an action generator. Alongside those simple actions, we also have something called Redux Tunks. My understanding is that a tunk is any action that can dispatch its own actions, or an action that instead of an object returns a function that does stuff. I'm not entirely clear on that, but the basic idea is that we can use them to write asynchronous code. So for instance, the fetch messages tank returns a function that first dispatches a met an action for saying, oh, hey, I'm starting to fetch messages. We'll use that to display a spinner. Then it connects to Firebase, looks at the messages list and subscribes to all value changes on that collection. Uh, and then we need some set timeout stuff because we're doing weird things and Redux panics a little bit, but it's okay. It all works. Um, once we get the value, the new value, we then dispatch a receive messages function, which goes through all the messages and for each one dispatches an add message function, which we're going to use to add messages to the actual list of messages. Now I said messages and function a lot and it's all kind of confusing. So here's a helpful diagram. We initiate a fetch, subscribe to all changes of the value, and then Firebase is going to forever keep triggering that until we stop the app. 
we receive messages, get a list of everything, and then we loop through the list and call add message to add them to the actual UI. We do something similar in the login method or login tank. We first say that, hey, we started authorizing the user, which the UI then uses to show a spinner. And we call Firebase auth, say sign in anonymously, which I promise you simplifies our app a lot. And then when Firebase is done signing you in, we dispatch user is now authorized and we start fetching messages. And that's kind of most of the logic that goes into our app. The other side of our app's business logic are the reducers. We want our data to roughly look like this. We have a chat room that has a list of messages and some metadata. Each message has an ID, some text, a timestamp and an author field with a name and, a and an avatar. Yes, this means that we're storing that stuff with every message and it's kind of wasteful, but it's also a lot easier to implement because we only have to look at one source of data to get everything. Uh, in Meta, we have some fetching, less fetched and so on stuffs that we're gonna use mostly for the UI part of the chat room. And then in user, that's where we store who the current user of the app is. What that looks like in code is a bunch of functions. We start with the root reducer, which has a chat room and a user. And then the chat room reducer is in turn built out of messages and meta reducer. And the meta reducer is actually a good example of what a typical reducer looks like. It usually has a giant switch function, which looks at action names. And then for each action name decides how to make a new copy of state with just the particular key value changed to whatever it needs to be. Now, I think it would be pretty boring if I try to explain every single reducer in our app to you. So you should read about them in the article and look at the code. But another interesting one is how we handle sending messages. It happens in the reducer for a single message and it has a side effect for sending a message we connect to firebase and push a new object uh, this gives us an id and then we set that particular object with data that we get from the action itself wow that was a lot of theory now let's build some ui I'll A lot of our components are going to be split into smart components that are connected to the Redux state and dumb components which just render stuff. The way smart components work is that we use connect and give <laughs> we use connect and give them a function that says this is how you take state and turn it into props for the component that's being rendered and a component that does the rendering. So for instance, for the login or chat app or login or chat component, we check if, it, if the user is authorized, we render chat UI. If it's not yet authorized, we render login UI. The login UI is a slightly smart component. The only reason it needs to be connected to our state at all is because of this part here. When the user starts authorizing, we want to show a spinner instead of the login button. What I really like about the login UI is how simple it was to make. It takes a title and two inputs and a, a login button. Um, the nice thing about the inputs is that we're going to build them so that they take a submit action as one of the props, which means that we can use the same input component for everything in our app because it doesn't have to know anything about where it's submitting to. It just internally handles all the text generation and then when it's ready to submit, it calls the submit action. Here's what that looks like in practice. When I type my name here and blur the, the input, it triggers an action called set username, uh, which has a previous state where the user is null and a next state where the user is, well, it has the name Suzette. Then if I put something in here and I press enter, it does set user. And when I click start chatting, that blurred out, it triggered set user avatar and then user start authorizing, then user authorized, and then start fetching, start fetching messages 
And after that, we had a bunch of add message and update message height uh, actions, and I'll show you what those are. But the result is that I'm logged in, and I now have an interface where I can say stuff. The way those inputs work is that we render a text input, which generates the UI, like the box that we type in. And on every change text, we store the current text that the event gives us into state. The reason we have to handle it in, in local state is because on submit editing, for whatever reason, doesn't give us the current value in our input. So we have to keep track of it ourselves. When submit happens, we dispatch the submit action that we got from props earlier uh, with the current state. And as I'm sure you've guessed, the login button triggers the login action when it's clicked. That's about it for the login button. The tricky part of chat UI is keeping it scrolled to the bottom. So I'm going to focus on that part of the logic. Basically, the UI has a title and then a keyboard aware scroll view, which is this part in the bottom. And the main reason we have that is so that when I click here and I open the keyboard, the UI scrolls up and gives me room to display the keyboard. This doesn't happen automatically on iOS or Android, which I find kind of weird, but I guess that's, that's just how it is. So you have to handle that yourself. So how do we keep the scroll view scroll to the bottom? Now, I don't know if my solution is the solution, but it's a solution and it works. The core of my solution is this scroll to bottom function right here. It uses a combination of three values to decide how much scrolling to perform on the scroll view and then calls scroll to position to scroll all the way down there. Basically, we keep track of the chat height, which updates with every new message that we add to the chat. So it grows like this and becomes much, much longer than our entire uh, phone. So that's this part. It gets very long and it lets you scroll all the way up and all the way down. Then we have scroll view height, which we update when the layouting happens. This tells us how, how tall our app is from here down to here. And then we have input height, which we need to offset the uh, scrolling. And we also get that on layout. Now, I know this looks very obvious and easy in retrospect, but trust me, it took me a really long time to figure out because I am very used to using the web where all this stuff kind of just happens on its own. I don't, I'm not used to thinking about, about layouting and scrolling and things like that. I just put stuff in a div and it renders. On React Native, you have to handle all of that yourself. Okay, one final thing. If you do decide to use your own Firebase config and don't wanna come chat with me, and yes, I will keep the simulator running, here's how you run a second simulator so that you can talk to yourself. You cd to, applica to your application's Xcode and you open a simulator app. This is going to pretend like it's not working. It's gonna throw a dialogue. You make that dialogue go away, and then you select the simulator that isn't currently showing a window, choose a different hardware device, let's say iPhone 6S, and then you CD back to your project, and when the app starts up, or when the simulator starts up, you call React Native run, run iOS with a specific simulator. Now, my computer is being really slow because it's running two simulators and Camtasia and doing a bunch of different things. So this is gonna be a lot faster for you. And that's the chat app. You should read the article for more details to really learn about how everything works in great detail. And you should definitely at least run the app and the simulator and come say hi to me. I'm gonna be hanging out for a while. And don't forget to subscribe by email because in the next lecture, we're gonna add notifications and background app refresh.